Let's do it. Hi, Sylvan. Hey, how's it going? Good. Good. How are you? Doing great. Benji, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm a little sniffly, but I'm I'm happy. That's awesome. <laughs> sniffly and happy. Yeah. You know, Western New York, we we just happened to I feel like we have the right mix of people and a really great environment that has just kind of coalesced together. The great thing about Buffalo is it really it's an urban setting, but it has kind of small town vibes. Like everybody yeah. knows everybody really well. Cool. And my previous apartment, my landlord worked with Margaret Wooster at uh, Great Lakes United. Her involvement in the in the early environmental movement in Buffalo was was incredibly important. Right? Mm -hmm. Like she really got like the friends of the 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 Buffalo River like up and running. Like she was a big part of that. I've been really excited that we 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 get to work with uh, the Buffalo Niagara water keepers at grassroots gardens. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we actually have a, a great partnership with them where we're helping them with their community advisory group centered around restoration of the Skajakwita Creek. One of the questions we've been playing with just the last week or so is like, do you know what an ecological paradigm looks like? Yeah. Well, and I, and I think when, when you mention ecological paradigm, you know, I, I think about um, indigenous communities, right. And how yep. their, their sense of ecological identity is so, it's so inherently baked into their culture and yeah. way of life. Um, and I feel like we, we need to continue to honor that and to, to acknowledge that way of living and that way of knowing exists into the present day. Yeah. And so I'm always looking for opportunities to, to engage, um, with indigenous communities. Uh, my colleague and I, we, we took a workshop called pathways to indigenous partnerships. What I got after the training was it, it was very emotional because I felt like a lot of what was discussed was never taught to me in school. And I feel like I was learning a completely new history. Sylvan exemplifies how open and appreciative our hearts need to be for real cultural regeneration to happen. We gotta pay homage to those who came before, folks like Margaret Wooster, who planted early seeds of what has become a vibrant movement we need to seize suppressed histories of local indigenous people to honor them and the ecological relationships they've kept intact. Welcome to Awakening Lands. Part of environmental education is pretty awesome at Essential Studios. I'm Benji Ross, and along with my teammate, Anna Prepera, in this episode, we'll learn a bit about cultivating love of place and ways that it's happening in Buffalo. We'll get a glimpse of the inspiring grassroots gardens of which Sylvan is a part, a group of regenerative leaders with an innovative model for community land connection and gardening in their urban landscape. Finally, Skijakwita Creek. We start with gratitudes, uh, and the reason being is, uh, yeah, taking a moment to express what it is that we're grateful for uh, helps us to step beyond limiting beliefs and constraints and envision, you know, greater possibility, greater potential. That's what we're all about here. So with that said, I'll give you the uh, the choice of kicking it off or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I would just like to say I'm I'm grateful that I live in Western New York. Um I'm I'm really happy that I live in Western New York in this present present time. Um, I feel like there's so many opportunities to 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 heal ecological harm, and I and I feel like I'm I'm playing a small part, which which I really appreciate. You know, I have a, a deep love for native plants and and the joy that seeing native plants brings to people. Uh, I have a deep love and appreciation for the pollinators that we share our, our home with. Um, and um, I have a deep love and care for um, the queer community of which I'm a part of and all the many wonderful resources that are available in Western New York to, to queer folks. And I, I genuinely appreciate that I, I work for an organization that is so focused on building community and that we have such a large footprint between Buffalo and Niagara Falls. Um, I feel like 
the work that I do every day is incredibly meaningful. And, and for that, I am, I am incredibly grateful. So yeah, one of the things that we felt was consistent through a lot of the different themes in your life is, uh, is cultivating this love of place. Uh, maybe we can get into a little exploration of your growing up in the Adirondacks and having access to mountains right outside your door. Yeah. It's amazing. And your grandparents operating a, an outdoor um, guiding company. Yeah. So you got, you got out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of my first memories growing up in the Adirondacks was literally my mom carrying me up a mountain in one of those like baby backpacks. Right. Like it's, it's, it's so deeply baked into who I, who I am as an individual, right, is that connection to the Adirondack Mountains. And I grew up in the High Peaks, which is like, if, if you're familiar with the Adirondacks, you know, it's such a large park that it, it covers a really large amount of different habitats. Like you've got the Adirondack Lowlands to the south, and then all of a sudden the mountains just kind of shoot up out of the ground, you know, and it really, like some of them are tall enough where there is kind of a tree line right we're like the i mean not to the scale of like the rockies but like you get high enough up and all of a sudden you're like uh oh where'd the trees go <laughs> so you know that was that was an incredible upbringing and, and I, I do feel really privileged to 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 have had that a lot of the experiences i have uh, I, I later learned in life not everyone has it. and I, I mean i genuinely appreciate that now. One of the things that we have found really is present in a lot of regenerative leaders, people who decide to dedicate their lives to this, is this early land connection. And I mean, you learned how incredibly important it is to develop land connection and a love for your place early in life. It was with that sense of the importance of land connection and the gift of providing that to others that eventually led Sylvan to becoming an environmental educator. One of the schools I went to when we lived in Keene um, actually had a nature trail behind the school. It was like a boardwalk that went through a wetland complex. And um, the, the teachers used that as a resource for, um, for outdoor education. You know, and um, I didn't really have a name for the profession until I got to SUNY Portland. And they actually had like a, a program specifically to train environmental educators. And I was like, oh, my God, this is a viable career. Like I could I could do this for a living. And so that was one of those like light bulb moments where I was just like. Being able to talk about nature, being in nature. It, it felt like such an incredible thing to share with folks. Despite the fact that environmental education clearly brings value to people, present day limitations hinder its impact. Sylvan recognizes the need for new approaches if we have any hope of forming land connection at young ages across entire communities. This has to be mentioned early on in this story. I genuinely love the field of environmental education, but I, I do feel like it has some problematic aspects, right? Like it is not the most diverse field. There are many barriers to entry, including livable wage and the conversation within the field itself. There's a lot of folks that are like, okay, well, this needs to be different. Like we need to figure out how we can make this a viable career and bring this resource to as many people as possible. And I appreciate that that conversation is happening, but I definitely want to see more action than talking. Do you have any idea what could unlock the ability to actually value that work for what it's worth? Like having kids that are loving their place, wanting to invest more deeply in their place, stay in their place. The value of that is immeasurable. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I, I, I think, and, and it goes back to this like cultural shift that you're talking about, right? Is that... Yeah that as a society in America, we're, we're still so baked into the extractive economy. Th there's this scarcity mindset. And, and that's the one thing that I'm always talking about with nature is that nature has its, its cycles. And it's, it has its like, yeah, there can be scarcity, but it's, it's more about like 
how nature cycles nutrients and and it's 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 very circular and and i think that people there there needs to be a, a shift in how we see the natural world and i feel like that's that's how happening very slowly so I, I i do hope that there's sustained momentum there there's a particular movement that's growing across turtle island and likely beyond it's a movement that's opening up a lot more access to environmental education and immersion early in life, forest schools. The movement is resulting in there being a lot more trained educators, but until our culture learns to value environmental connection and understanding, until it learns to see how important it is for people to love and be devoted to their place, the perennial problem of funding will persist. One of the many jobs I had out of college was I worked for a forest preschool. And that got me tapped into the um, Eastern Region Association for Forest and Nature Schools. And they're doing it, an incredible job at providing trainings for educators that want to pursue early education models that foster early immersion in, in nature. And many, many organizations are trying to do more forest preschool models that reach out to urban communities. That movement, like the environmental ed movement, could be better about reaching out to urban communities. But of course, there's a significant funding gap. And so I appreciate that that organization is trying very hard to kind of train the teachers first in preparation for funding, right? To be like, hey, you have the tools for success. Now, when the funding comes through, you can hit the ground running and be able to provide this program to to communities that might not necessarily be able to afford it, but they can offer scholarships and things like that. Many of the forest preschools on the West Coast are doing a lot towards that. There's a, there's a, there's a ton in Washington State, and there are even more programs popping up on the East Coast and in the Midwest as time progresses. Sylvan is undeniably a weaver with the innate desire to lift up others doing the good work so to those of you in Buffalo who are currently inspired by environmental education, here's a local organization facilitating opportunities for land connection. The Buffalo Women of Environmental Learning and Leadership. Be well. One of the things I wanted to mention too, and, and it's another local nonprofit that I want to kind of uplift, is the Buffalo Women of Environmental Learning and Leadership. And um, this was a nonprofit that was founded by Helen Toledo while she was a graduate student at Buff State. And the organization does such a good job on providing opportunities for folks in, in Buffalo to get outside and to experience nature. And I really appreciate that they're providing that service and, and they're coming from, from an equity lens, which I really appreciate. I just wanted to highlight them as one of the one of the organizations that's doing incredible action when it comes to environmental education. A lot of people don't necessarily think about regeneration in urban areas, but mm -hmm. you, that's kind of your specialty. You work yeah. for an organization that is, uh, you know, ur urban community gardens and spreading that network. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your perspective of ecology in an urban setting. Yeah. Well, what what I really love about our approach to to ecology in an urban setting is we're we're people centered first and foremost. And by we, he means Grassroots Gardens, Western New York, which has a pretty clever model and is doing a lot of good. We're facilitating land connection. We have a, a lease program with the city where where we can request land on behalf of community members, and we've few years ago became an accredited land trust. So we can actually own land on behalf of community members. And one of the things I really appreciate about our model is that the manifestation of the material elements in those community garden spaces are directed by community members. We can provide like technical expertise and, and feedback and things like that. But for the most part, these spaces are designed by the people in the community. And I think that that's inherently sustainable. They're creating that sense of place, right? Like they can take a vacant lot and plant plants that they love 
plants that they enjoy. And then that that connection to space is like instantaneous. And so that's that's what I appreciate. No no garden in our network is is the same as another garden in the same network, right? Like it's it's incredibly diverse between all of our community gardens. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um because I think your role in grassroots gardens is really connecting to community members. I mean, if <laughs> I'm I am part of um, the community garden close to my house, and it's always Sylvan. <laughs> Sylvan's always there, fixing up the garden. Um, you know, hosting events. If you want to get involved in the grassroots gardens, it's him you talk to. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you guys have developed such a close relationship with the community. Uh, to the point where like other organizations come to you and be like hey like we want to do this thing can you partner with us because you guys have such trust of the community yeah well you know i'm i'm just one part of a, of a much larger group like our staff at grassroots gardens we, we each have a, a very specific role right like our program manager lock like he he works with so many different gardens you know and i'm i'm really only working with very specifically like 15, 20 gardens, if that. And we have a garden network of over a hundred gardens, right? So it really does take a, a team of, of dedicated individuals that we each have our own specialized knowledge, right? And um, the nice thing about it not falling on one person, right? Is that we can form relationships with um, particular gardeners, with particular community members, and, and all of our work kind of works together. My work specifically, like I've worked with gardens that want to join the land trust or have a particular interest in protecting their space long-term, right? And so, you know, I, I joined Grassroots um, by June, it will have marked two years, right? And I'm still constantly learning and adapting and, and changing my relationship with the uh, with the people that volu the volunteer to steward these spaces right and that's one of the one things i i really appreciate about our model is is it's completely free you know there really is no barrier to access many of our community gardeners that have have been at this for like 10 plus years you know like we're we're coming up on 30 year anniversary you know, I, I think that our longevity as an organization speaks to the the relationships that we've built in community, right? Like we, we're we're supported so much by our community and and working with them long term. You're truly part of the community. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the one that's the one thing I really liked about the job, right? Is it it literally like Buffalo is a great city for getting to know your neighbor and things like that. But yeah, this job literally like put me into the community and and not just where I live, but like the whole city too. Yeah. So I'm literally in every part of the city of Buffalo and Niagara Falls, which I really appreciate. Grassroots Gardens model has at a high level, literally woven itself into the communities across Buffalo and up to Niagara Falls. And one of Sylvan's roles is to connect with people directly on the ground to hear what is most meaningful to them. You know, we focus primarily on providing food the vegetables culturally relevant food and i'm trying to also extend that to native plants that provide food as well it's been a great learning experience for me right of being like what if we plant these native plants and folks are like but can we eat them <laughs> and i'm like fair point i will get the native plants that you can eat and then if we have space we'll plant the plants for pollinators and stuff like that <laughs> and speaking of pollinators and stuff like that, Sylvan is playing a part in other efforts to bring systems of ecology into the urban landscape. They're encouraging residents of Buffalo and Niagara Falls to step into participation in the diversity of roles needed for the holistic care of place. You're also a board member of the Pollinator Conservation Association with Jay Burney, who we had yep. previously interviewed. But one of the things that we had talked about before was in comparison to some of these larger, more rural uh, regenerative projects like Marcus Roston is involved in, where there is an entire eastern 
wild way that uh, Western New York is linking into. You are also you also recognize the importance of more urban pathways and wild ways, corridors for smaller animals, for pollinators. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the nice thing too is that it, it's not just falling to the, the Pollinator Conservation Association to to do that work. Like Michelle Lockett at the Niagara, Niagara River Greenway Commission, she's doing that work. But also um, Anne McCooey at the Black Rock Riverside Alliance, she's also doing that work more so focused on like the Black Rock and Riverside neighborhoods. They're um, attempting to plant more trees in the urban setting, like really adding to the to the urban landscape in a substantial way, not just for the benefit of pollinators, but for the benefit of the neighbors that live in that area too. That's mm -hmm. that's one of the things that, I mean, and you know, Anna, like the, the amount of inequity that exists within the city of Buffalo, like it, it's been hard baked into the way our spaces are designed mm -hmm. you know? and i think many of us are trying to combat that now right by becoming stewards of green space throughout the city right and like encouraging others to like plant more trees and plant more flowers and just become genuine caretakers of the space let's get stoked about planting trees and manifesting positive change in our spaces the environmental community in Buffalo is buzzing about one of the projects Grassroots Gardens is taking part in, a local effort focused on bringing positive change to Buffalo, one that is demonstrating the transformative potential of holding spaces where people can share in their humanity together, where they can be vulnerable and real and learn what it's like to feel good about co-stewardship of place. Could you tell us a little bit more about this uh, community advisory group? Because it's it's really quite innovative and it, 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 there's a lot of excitement around around that and grassroots gardens is supporting yeah. that that initiative yeah well and the nice thing about the the work that we're doing with with the community advisory group right is that um we're gonna be sort of baking watershed education into a lot of our outreach efforts throughout the year or the I believe this grant covers a number of years we actually have quite a few gardens that are within this skajakwita subshed or sub watershed that ultimately drains into the Niagara River. And it was great. I was able to use my GIS background to sort of calculate how much square footage our green spaces assist with the slowing down of water as it moves across the landscape. You know, and it's significant. I, I want to say it was almost like five square miles within the city itself. So, I mean, that is no no small amount. We We just recently had our community advisory group meeting and I appreciate how intentional the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeepers was about um, outreach to communities. We we had an astounding amount of applicants that that wanted to join the community advisory group, and and that's the other thing too that I really appreciate was that the funding that they were able to secure is actually paying people to provide their feedback in this advisory group. So we're not asking folks to volunteer their time free freely. It's like you're you're being compensated for this which I think is fantastic. You yeah. know, and, they, and I do hope that the funding landscape creates opportunities for that to continue to happen because it, that's that's a good way to build trust. What I really appreciated from that, that first community advisory group meeting was Terry Robinson, who I'm also, he's also on the board of the Pollinator Conservation Association. You know, he's he's been in Buffalo his whole life. You know, he's he's had a presence of like 30, 40 plus years he, he said to me, he was like, this feels different. This feels significant that so, maybe something might might actually change. And for him to feel that hopeful in that moment, I was like, okay, I respect your wisdom. Appreciate his hype. I, I wonder if we could like kind of dig into that a little bit. Do you do you have like a, you know, a a sense of of what was making him hopeful? What was making him feel like this moment might be different? Honestly, I, I think it was the way that the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeepers, how they were navigating the conversation, mm. right? Like they were, they really were asking about genuine feedback. They held space for, for us to feel raw and authentic emotion, right? Yeah. Cause like the theme I got when we, when we were kind of reflecting on, like they had provided drone footage 
of the course of the Skajakwita Creek. So they were able to be like, this is what it looks like from this high up. Many of the community members understandably had this sense of loss and grief, you know, that they were experiencing centered around, around the creek. I appreciated that they were holding space for all of us to experience those emotions and to help us kind of process the grief a little bit. I mean, that, that's hard to do in one setting. The nice thing about this group is that, you know, it'll meet over the next couple of years. And, and I do hope that we're able to sort of continue this uh, emotional journey together, that it's, it's not just talking about the science of ecological restoration, but sort of reclaiming ownership of, of that shared resource of the mm -hmm. skin of the creek, you know, and, and I appreciated that they were like, we want to hear your thoughts on what ecological restoration would look like. And they even went as far as to say, like, may, maybe ecological restoration doesn't necessarily mean like daylighting sections of the creek that are buried, but that it could mean paying homage to the creek, right? Like maybe there's an art installation that illustrates the, the flow of the creek underground, mm. right? Like it, it might not be possible to daylight parts of the creek. And they really emphasize that if the community doesn't want that, then that's not going to happen. That I really appreciated because I'm like, that's, that's what I, I want for ecological restoration as Buffalo is I want it to be community led and community motivated. You know, understanding the realities of place requires that we have these places where we can open up the full spectrum of emotion and be vulnerable together and work our way through that, you know, feel good about doing things together. Yeah. It seems foundational. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that's, I think that's the only way that things are going to get done in, in the poly crises that we're experiencing, right? That we need to engage the, the core part of what makes us human, right? The, the yeah. emotional capacity mixed with the, the, the modern scientific understanding of what we can do to heal these systemic harms. And then there's something that Sylvan and us here at Awakening Lands clearly care a lot about, bringing energy and coherence to a unified voice for the region, to see the regenerative movement in some sense as one. When I feel like Anna, the work that you're doing with the Western New York Environmental Alliance, right? The, the 30 by 30, that's a really good, great place to collect a unified voice, right? And like that, that was the whole point of forming the Western New York Environmental Alliance was kind of bringing everyone to the table. Mm -hmm. So many of our, our local environmental leaders are involved in that. I've been involved with the uh, the Western New York Native Plant Collaborative, which is a spinoff of the Western New York Environmental Alliance. And they, I'm pretty excited because I, I believe in the next two weeks, I'm meeting with a few community members to go over like a social media plan. How do we provide content about native plants on social media? We're talking with the person that that's been a big part of keeping that social media presence alive, right? And like, how can we invite moderators to come in and to help generate content, things like that. There, there's definitely lots of like little conversations happening all across Western New York, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I noticed is even just having some sort of place where all of this information can be held so mm -hmm. that people can access different um, organizations information, even as simple as knowing what events are happening this weekend or yeah. three months from now so that they don't overlap and they can find opportunities to collaborate rather than having separate events that kind of divert attention and resources away. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's something that I imagine would be really powerful is just having these storytelling um, opportunities in collaboration with all of the different organizations. Thank you so much, Sylvan. Um, I think you've given us a ton of resources to share in uh, the show notes for your uh, your episode, but uh, is there a, a, any other ways that our listeners can support you or follow along with your story? Absolutely. You can, um, if you can go to our website, um, grassrootsgardens.org, um, 
there's going to be a pop-up that says help our gardens grow in 2024 by supporting our annual appeal. And that there's a button there to donate. Um, that would be an incredible way to support the work that, that I'm, that I'm doing with my team here at Grassroots Gardens. Um, and I would, we, we would all really appreciate that donation. Well, thank you, Sylvan. Yeah. Thank you, appreciate Sylvan. It. Thank you. Sylvan, stay golden. Anybody ever told you that? No, it's the first <laughs> time. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you again. Looking forward to meeting you in person. Yeah. Appreciate it. I'm looking forward to it too. And I will see you this weekend. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you're feeling a jolt of inspiration. If you'd like to support Anna and me in our ongoing efforts to tell these stories, you can donate to us on our Patreon at Awakening Lands. Links for all of this can be found in the show notes. Thanks. And please... Tell your landscape we said hello.